Amanda Brown Learman is the Senior Director of Policy Engagement at GoFundMe. She's also the executive executive director of GoFundMe.org, a partner of GoFundMe, which mobilizes for crisis relief and other philanthropic causes. Uh, I just had mentioned to Amanda that we had previously worked together when Amanda served as the executive director of Supermajority, an organization working to build women's political power. She was also served as the political and organizing director for the DNC for the 2018 midterm cycle, uh, where there was a surge in women, yes. <laughs> Clap that up. We know we needed that support. Uh, where, a, where there was a surge of women participation in voters, volunteers, donors, and even candidates themselves. Uh, as the campaign director for an $80 million super PAC in 2016, and as the political director at Rock the Vote. Uh, she got her start uh, as an organizer on the Obama campaign, has worked in the White House, also served as the executive, executive director of the National Women's Business Council, uh, so much more. Uh, but if we could give a nice round of applause for our host today, Amanda Brown Learman. Thank you, Cameron. Um, what a pleasure. I got, it's very fun to be in this room also because I have my family support here. So shout out to my mom and to my little sister. Um, <laughs> wouldn't be here without them. So um, yes, thank you all for joining. As Cameron said, it's great to see folks out bright and early on the first day of CBC. I know it's a little bit rough, but we appreciate you coming out today. Um, we're going to get started with a little bit of a fireside chat. We're going to, we have some questions for the Congresswoman, um, and then we're going to try Try to get her out of here so that she can go vote um, and do her, her day job. Um, so thank you. Do you want to have a seat, sure. Congresswoman? Oh. Awesome. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, okay, Can, was it Cameron? He said, yeah. I'm from the black church too. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. That's so much better. That is so much better. It's good to be here. It's so great to have you. Um, so you are incredible, um, like black girl magic all the way, um, an incredible resume of accomplishments even before you decided to run for office. Um, obviously then um, entered Congress and are now running for Senate. Can you tell us a little bit about what motivated you to just take that step to run for office? Yeah. Well, um, first of all, I, I have to say how honored I am to be here with you and all of your accomplishments. And I wanna give Amanda another round of applause. I was the one that started the applause the last time because I think it's first of all really important um, to acknowledge the work that you do to make it possible for me to do the work that I'm doing. And for us as a people to even be uplifted. A lot of times there are people like sitting right here in front of me that might not be on the TV all the time and might not, but are the real reason why this works. And so I wanna first acknowledge that. Um, and, and secondly, um, I just think it's really important too that we celebrate each other and celebrate our successes because this work is not easy. And what, why this was exciting to me to even have this conversation is because it's a chance for like-minded people to come together and to, to support each other. So I wanted to, when you talk about black girl magic, magic doesn't happen on its own. It's a, it's a, it's a, community, a community thing. Um, me running for office, um, it's funny because one of the people who worked with me on my campaign and then also worked in the beginning of my office is sitting in the front row, Kalila. Kalila, she actually, and I, look, I got Heinz in the back of my mind, but she got married and it's winters. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, and, but, but, and, and we go way back because um, I actually made her prom dress. She, she, yeah. Uh, Another skill. And <laughs> it's even worse than that. She's a twin, so I made both of their gowns while I was Secretary of Labor, I think it was. it was. Yeah, in the middle of a trip to Japan. But, and I, I guess... We get a round of applause for that. Well, <laughs> and she now works at the Department of Education, and that's the tie to the future of work, is education is one of the keys. Um, community empowerment and upliftment is one of the keys. And for me, um, I... I just shared, I got the chance to work in Delaware in different roles as Secretary of Labor, Head of State Personnel, CEO of the Urban League, 
where there was really a focus on jobs and the economy and people being able to live their purpose um, and people to be able to find themselves, like go fund me, go find me, finding ourselves. And so I did these different jobs, had an incredible career. I loved, loved life, um, but it really wasn't until um, meeting a guy who um, was Omega Psi Phi Q dog, bro brilliant engineer, funny, sexy, cool, um, and second, you know, my second marriage, love of my life, and I met him. He was working in Shanghai, China. Um, I ended up like a Beyonce song. I just fell in love. I just quit my job. I quit my job. I sold my house. I sold my car. I put my daughter in college, and I moved to China and, and just really had an experience of, as an international relations major, I got to experience other parts of the world as well. Charles and I lived over there for about five years and moved back to the States. And as some of you know, um, he, when we moved back, uh, he went on a business trip and before his meetings, played a game of basketball with his colleagues, ruptured his Achilles tendon and ultimately blood clots went to his heart and lungs. And at the age of 52, Charles passed away. And it shook me to the core. I did not know what I was going to do next in my life, what my purpose was. And it literally was just being in a place of pain and anger and sadness um, that some days just getting up in the morning was success. And literally, it was almost a year to his passing that I was in the supermarket with a dad and three kids, I think, in front of me and he put back grapes because they were $9. And it snapped me out of my own grief. It made me recognize I'm okay. I got a house. I've got family and support and mental health counseling and all the things, and a pastor and all the things I need. But a lot of other people were struggling just to make ends meet. Our city of Wilmington was being called Murder Town USA because of gun violence. The status of black women and girls. I'm, I'm a member of the Coalition of 100 Black Women. We had a report, and I just, I just said to myself, I'm still here. I, I have more to give. And um, I decided to run for Congress, having never run for anything in my life. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I had never been in a debate. I was debating lawyers. I had, and, and I was bad. I mean, I, I was really, it was bad at first. I, I, I never raised that kind of money. It took over a million dollars, you know? But every story I heard propelled me to keep going, keep going, you got this. I would stand in the mirror some mornings and just say, Good morning, Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester. I hadn't even won yet. I was like, I'm going to speak those things that are not as though they were. We're going to manifest this. But I will tell you, coming in when I did was the right time. I came in in 2016, the same time as the former president. And I will tell you, um, I have loved being in Congress. I have loved being of service at this moment fighting for clean air and clean drinking water, fighting for jobs. I love this work. And even, you know, as I think about the run for Senate, the potential of fighting for our freedoms, reproductive freedom, that nobody, I always say there's no room in my womb for a politician or my daughters, or now my granddaughters, fighting for our democracy. Some of you saw me on January 6th, trapped up in the gallery, praying, because that's all I knew to do. And I could feel our ancestors. And so for me, taking the leap to run for Senate is really about continuing the work that we started, but it's also about going deeper on these issues and having more impact. That's what it's about for me. In Delaware, we made history when I was elected, becoming the first woman to serve us in Congress and the first black person. But I don't do this to make history. 
I'm doing this to make an impact. Yeah. And that's what this conversation is about. How do we make an impact? You're incredible. Um, I feel like I loved you before this, and now I love you even more. So total fangirl over here. Um, so thank you. What are, what are some of the things that you're most proud of during your tenure of leadership? It's such a great question, and it's such a hard question because I, I you know, for me, I, you know, you kind of, you check a box and you move on to the next, and you check a box and you move on to the next, and you think about, again, what kind of impact can I have? And in Delaware, people think that we're just a, a blue state. First of all, we're blue, purple, and red. And some of you have gone down to the beach in Delaware, Rehoboth, or some of our beaches, but if you turn the opposite direction and go the other way, it, you will run into, um, mm, how do I want to say this? You're in a safe space. You may <laughs> run into some Confederate flags. You may run into a sign that says, thank you, Mr. Trump. I would like to add to that for, for leaving, but, <laughs> but, but, but you may run into all kinds of things. And for me, what has been proud is to hear the voices of Delawareans and then turn those into action. Like we had a com communities that didn't have clean drinking water. And so to be able to get into legislation as we did the bipartisan infrastructure bill or the Inflation Reduction Act, opportunities for communities to now have clean drinking water in Delaware. We in our state have a high cancer rate. And for me to work on environmental justice and to work with communities in Delaware where they are now able to get air quality monitors to monitor the air and then to, from a community perspective, and then notify all their community members. And to, that makes me proud. The work that we're doing on, that we did on the Inflation Reduction Act to lower costs, I specifically worked on the lowering costs for our seniors for drugs and drug prices. I'm proud of that. But I would say probably one of the biggest things that I'm proud of was on January 6th. Because some people say, what was my um, best day in Congress? The worst day was also the best day. The insurrection and knowing how close we were to losing our democracy, knowing how close some of us were to losing our lives, but then coming back later that night and certifying that election and saying hate will not win, um, you know, racism will not win, these things will not win because we did our job. To me, that was one of the proudest moments of my life. We did our job. And so, um, yeah, I, I, it's too much to say that I'm proud of. But, um, and I'm proud I got a great team. Kalila was on that team. Andrew, Will is in the back. Because we don't do this work alone. It truly is, um, it truly is the collection of all of us. And that's why the theme of my campaign is Bright Hope. Bright Hope was the church that my grandmother attended for 70 years in Philadelphia and that we would go to. And for me, Bright Hope isn't just the name of a church, it is a way of living that even in the midst of our trials and tribulations, we dig deep to find that spark of hope in trying times and that it's the collective Bright Hope that's gonna shine while people are trying to dim our light. It's the collective right hope. So, so when y'all start feeling like weary and you're well doing and you start feeling bad, just say to somebody, bright hope. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor right now and say, bright hope. Bright hope. I said, okay, you in the back with the, with the shirt on with the, yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. A little bit louder, bright hope. There you go. There you go. I Good feel, job for now. I felt that.
Um, all right, I'm gonna transition us a little bit. Um, let's talk about the historic investments that were recently made, the greatest since the New Deal. Um, there are some incredible, it could mean incredible opportunity for people, but so many people don't understand it, don't know about it. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about how it can translate into the lives of everyday people. Um, what do these, and I'm, and I wanna be specific also about black people. What do these investments, what can these investments mean for black people? I mean, you know, it's interesting to me because the Biden-Harris administration, as well as um, particularly Democrats in Congress, but on some of these bills, they were bipartisan. The, this, this moment of investment is like none other that we've ever seen. I mean, first of all, over 13.5 million jobs creating, created, manufacturing jobs, jobs that we are bringing back home, jobs that will pay good salaries have been created in these past two years because of both the American Rescue Plan, um, you know, our, our work to really rebuild through the, um, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, the, I could go on with all these names, but the bottom line is we have been doing these things through a lens of equity. And even this administration started out with their first executive order to say, we're gonna have a whole of government look at how we are doing things. Because one of the reasons that we, whether it's healthcare, whether it's housing, whether it's access to capital, one of the reasons we have not seen the needle move and why we have seen these gaps in us building generational wealth is because of things that are structural and institutional. And we think we can do a little program here or a little program there and think it will move the needle. It won't. We gotta do structural things. And that's what these pieces of legislation have been about. That's what the work of the Black Caucus has been about. It has been about saying that if you're gonna give PPP loans, and that's what happened. We started to see PPP loans given out, but they weren't going to the people that needed it the most. And we had to come back, and it was a person like a Maxine Waters who said, uh, no you don't, we're looking at these numbers. Nydia Velasquez on the Small Business uh, Committee, they were chairing those committees, and they said, we're gonna look at these numbers, and we're gonna now go back and target the money. If this is important to us, then we gotta put our money where our mouth is. So it's everything from small businesses, to black farmers, to uh, as we even look at our health disparities, making sure that we are targeting those resources and that they get to the right places. It's also about who is leading in these organizations. You know, like Kalila just shared with me, she just got another promotion. I'm just saying. I'm just saying, you, you said on the front we, we row. We should invite like, her up here. <laughs> but we'll think, put you on the panel now. But there you go. But think about it. Think about the numbers of people who are now in positions of power that can really have an impact, whether it is a Marsha Fudge who's looking at housing, even on the Supreme Court, Katanji Brown Jackson. How powerful is that for us? And so in this moment, um, you will see Hakeem Jeffries has started what he has designated as a uh, regional leadership council. It is nine of us. I'm one of the members. I represent Washington, Delaware, New Jersey, Virginia, and Maryland. And it's my job as well as the other eight members to number one, make sure that the administration is implementing these bills for our veterans, the PAC Act, for, for, uh, for our seniors, making sure that those $35 insulin prices, capping the cost of insulin, those things that are really gonna affect us because we know we're disproportionately affected with things like diabetes. We gotta make sure we implement them and then we gotta make sure we get the word out because if people don't know about them, what good is it? And part of it is who talks about it? That means it's all of us engaged in this. Um, I gave the example a, a, a couple of times this week so far of how we talk about things. So for example, 
one of the things in the Inflation Reduction Act was, again, um, was to make sure that we got our seniors um, um, free, you know, vaccinations, you know. And so one of my team, we were talking to a group of seniors, and, and she shared with them that there will be no co cost share for vaccinations. In the audience, everybody just looked. And I, then I turned around and said, they're free. <laughs> vaccinations for seniors are free. Your shingle shot is free. Everybody started clapping because they understood that. So we got to make it plain. We got to make it clear. We got to make sure people know the ways that they can reach out, whether it's the Small Business Administration or whether it's the, uh, our, our, our office. We got to make sure that we get the word out because this is a moment that is transformational for all of us. And can I just say, on another note. You can. Because <laughs> I looked back at the room and I saw one of the things that is the title of this is about the future of work. And, you know, when I came into Congress, um, I started noticing all over the place people talking about the future of this, the future of that. And I recognized and saw data that the jobs most at risk for automation were mostly held by people of color and women, particularly black folks. And I began um, this bipartisan future of work caucus because I did not want us to get left behind. If the jobs of today and tomorrow, if we're not preparing for them, if we're not making sure people have the right skills, the right opportunities, like bills that I've put forward in my jobs agenda, <laughs> then, then, then we, will be, we will fall further behind. And so in this jobs agenda is not just um, training, which is important, because I even have a bill on immersive technology, augmented reality, virtual reality, and using that kind of technology to train people in communities, in community colleges. I stood inside of a, with my headset on, inside of a skeleton, and saw a spleen, and saw the heart, and I got to put on goggles and, and, and these VR glasses, and I was doing construction work. I did a boom lift, I did welding, and thank God it was virtual because I would have burned that place down. <laughs> but virtual reality, we need to have access. This jobs agenda includes housing because housing is the way that we build generational wealth. This also includes our returning citizens because we know that when people come back to the community, they need a second chance and a clean slate. So I've got clean slate in this jobs agenda. But it's also about making sure that people can be entrepreneurs and live their dreams and their purpose and their vision. And so to me, the future of work is now. The future of work is a passion for me because I want to see all of us thrive. Thrive, thrive. Okay, one, one last question. Um, I, I got my start drinking all of the Hope Kool-Aid, actually, that Barack Obama was serving. Um, and I love that. Yeah, worked on, worked on the Obama campaign. Um, so have like a deep, I'm an, I'm an organizer. So for the folks who are in this room, what do they need to do? How can they prepare for the future of work? Well, you know, I mean, there are, there are a lot of things that everybody can do individually. I, I, and I want to go to the, the Kool-Aid, too. Um, <laughs> there is a lot of it. <laughs> yeah. And I think, first of all, you being here is a part of that. Getting engaged, understanding the lay of the land um, is really important. Uh, I think the second thing, and I, OK, I'm just going to be blunt. That's my middle name. <laughs> It's my middle name. As you talked about the Kool-Aid, it just made me think that a lot of times we have an expectation that some leader on high is going to do it for us. This pandemic to me, to me is just, it showed all of us that it's one thing for me to tell people watch out for your health, get a vaccination. But it was really the pastors. It was 
Um, it was the pediatricians. It was my pharmacist that I went to. It was my grandmother or my friend who loved and cared about me that encouraged me to do the right thing during this pandemic. And I feel that as we talk about hope, the reason why my theme of my campaign is bright hope is because Number one, internally, we got to dig deep in this moment. We got to find in the recesses of us what it takes to continue to be hopeful in a time where everything on the news would tell you not to be. Everything. So whatever it is that you do to keep yourself whole and well, you got to know what that is and do it. I know what it is for me. Every night, almost, I take an Epsom salt bath with lavender. <laughs> Every night, I spray my pillow with lavender mist before I go to bed. I got some soothing music. Sometimes it's like, you know, chimes and stuff. Other times it's my love sleep playlist, you know? I'm just saying, I got a little, you know, a little something, something on there. In the morning, I get up. And I'm like, what's happening around the world today? I'll listen to a podcast while I'm putting on my makeup, but I'll listen to gospel music and I'll put it on shuffle. When I'm walking through the tunnel in Congress and I see stuff that's just like crazy, I have my Beyonce playing, you won't break my soul. Figure out what you need in this moment, whether it's mental health, counseling, take care of yourself. You can't do the work, you can't support yourself or live your dreams or do your business if you're not taking care of yourself. So one is internal, the other is external. Again, who's coming to save us? We are. We are in this moment. That's why I get pumped in the morning. That's why I look at myself and say, bright hope. Now I say, good morning, Senator Lisa Blunt Rochester. Speak it. <laughs> Let's speak what we want for our communities, for our families, and for ourselves. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yesterday I got to wear, I have this, um, this dress actually that this like artist made for me that has all of the incredible black women and leadership on it. So I had your face on my dress um, and my chill. I have a six, a four and a two year old and my six year old calls it my badass woman dress. So I need you to take a selfie with me so I can like show my kid that um, I actually got to meet you in person. Um, so can we, can we do a little, uh, yeah, let's do, let's do this. Yeah. Everyone smile. <laughs> Love it. Thank awesome. you so much. Thank you. Can everyone give a round of applause? <laughs>